Okay, so we start with the webinar. It's already 2.34. Yeah. Um, we are still having participants, attendees coming up, and uh, uh, we would not like to wait for uh, them. Um, Good afternoon, all. Uh, it's good to see you here, all attendees and students and professionals. I welcome one and all for our the second webinar uh, by Dr. Hiral Patel. I hope everyone present here is safe and sound. Um, yeah. uh, Dr. Hiral Patel uh, is a lecturer in uh, Advanced building performance evaluation at the Welsh, Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University. Uh, Hiral's current research and teaching at Welsh School of Architecture aims to better understand, understand clients and users of built environment. She is interested in themes of learning, social material practices, holistic building performance, and adaptation of buildings. Her PhD research funded by Engineering and Physical Science Research Council in the UK, theorizes the practices of adapting academic library buildings. A project with Higher Education Design Quality Forum spoofed the future of learning environments in the higher education sector. Her research around the EEGW achieve explores the linkages between organizational practices and the built environment to understand the changing nature of work. Having trained as an architect from India and practiced in the UK, her industry experience involves developing business processes, managing projects, and technical building design. She has also provided program management consistency for higher education clients. As a qualification, she is a bachelor from University Bachelor in Architecture. She's done her messy in project management from University of Reading, her PhD again in University of Reading. She is now an associate fellow uh, of Higher Education Academy since 2019. This lecture is going to talk about finding users, building performance research and architecture. This lecture will make a case for the importance of user research and architecture by addressing the debates of building performance. Current mainstream approaches to building performance evaluations emphasis technical aspects only. There is a need to complement uh, these approaches with a qualitative approach to understand how buildings are used. This lecture will draw on the doctor and postdoctoral research on buildings in use, as well as her teaching on MSc Advanced Building Performance Evaluation at the School of Architecture, Cardiff. Um, here I would like a Professor Pallavi Nhiga, ma'am, to address the webinar. Thank you so much, Rohini. Uh, I welcome Dr. Hiral and I hope it's a good morning for her there. Though it's a good afternoon in India, but it's a good morning for her and we are really privileged that uh, uh, Dr. Hiral Madam has taken out time for us, uh, us here in India and uh, with such an elaborate experience and uh, such a glorified uh, uh, experience of uh, uh, such a uh, intense topic of research. I hope the students and the professionals who have joined this webinar will have a very fruitful and insightful uh, listening by her today. Welcome madam. Welcome. Thank you ma'am. Yes, um, I would now give a platform to Dr. Hiral Patel to start with her webinar. Um, thank you so much, Rohini. Uh, it's a pleasure to be involved um, uh, in this webinar. 
Uh, I think uh, Sundar was a was a bhai Patel in the field of technology for organizing this, and especially to Rohini, with whom I have uh, like memories of lots of late night group works when I was when we were studying at uh, NS University. Um, I I would I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, so I'm having yeah okay I can probably now share my screen. And I just want to make sure that you can, uh, you know, if you can confirm that you can see me as well as the slides. Uh, yeah, we can see your. Okay, and is the sound quality okay? Quality, is, the sound is perfect. Okay, great. Um, so when I was looking at, at the seminar series banner, which was just put, uh, uh, just which was just posted up uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I was delighted to, to read that uh, SVIT is thinking about architecture as a through an inter interdisciplinary approach. Um, I think that is so crucial and a lot of things that I would, I would talk about today kind of uh, builds into that idea of architecture as, as an inter interdisciplinary practice. Um, I'm also, I also read that SVIT is uh, constructing a new academic building and I hope that some of the things that I'm going to talk about today which relates to higher education sector within the UK uh, is of relevance um, uh, for, for that project as well as uh, future developments. Um, Architectural research uh, can be classed into three categories. First, uh, architectural processes, uh, which can include design process, uh, coordination process, collaborate, uh, and kind of um, construction processes. Um, there can be a, a, another category, which is architectural products. And this can be around the style, uh, the material, and um, the kind of uh, um, the, the built form of, of architecture. Um, and the third category is around architectural performance. Um, and performance, I uh, conceptualize performance as quite a broad uh, subject. It's not just a matter of technical performance, but um, as you will see throughout the presentation, uh, there are various aspects of performance. Some are under con conceptualized, but that is, that is the kind of uh, challenge that I want to um, focus on. Um, this quote is from Frank Duffy, who was uh, president of uh, Royal Institute of British Architect, uh, Architects in the 1990s. And he was also a co-founder of um, a firm called DGW, about whom I will talk later. And um, you can see uh, his kind of um, um, plea here. So research into how buildings perform, what they contribute, and what they need is very different from both the design and management of buildings. Of the, of the three, which is the performance, the design, and the management, research, uh, in his opinion, is the most demanding and yet in architectural practice <coughs> and in schools of architecture, probably the most neglected. So I think it's, it's, um, it's a quite a, a good step uh, that uh, Rohini and her team has taken here to kind of bring this topic of uh, building performance uh, to, to your institution. Performance-related uh, um, uh, knowledge is also an issue for, for the profession as a whole. So this is again a quote from Frank Duffy. Uh, and he, he's saying that architects, it's written about uh, 15 years after he was the president of RIDA. Uh, and it says that architects in general have not created an adequate body of professional knowledge based on researching, testing, and articulating clients' requirements. Um, I would really want to hear your experiences of uh, user research, uh, and if you can put them in the chat function as we progress through this presentation. 
Is that the case in your experience as well? How are you uh, engaging with users and clients? So recently um, at uh, RIPA, um, this is 2016-2017, uh, uh, there was a renewed interest in, uh, in creating this, uh, this knowledge base uh, for architecture. And uh, they were focusing on post-occupancy valuation. Now, uh, if you haven't been familiar with, with this term, post-occupancy valuation, what it means is that once a building is completed, um, a series of um, um, evaluation uh, processes are carried out. This might include testing building performance using uh, meter readings, how much energy the building is consuming, measuring that. It can also include uh, undertaking user surveys to, uh, uh, to kind of explore if users are comfortable thermally acoustic-wise, et cetera, in the building. Uh, this is a, a recent statistic. Um, it might have changed uh, since 2017, but um, it might not have that much. <laughs> so 99% of uh, charter architecture practices offer POE to clients in the UK, and none of them are generating any revenues from POE services. So there is this gap. Uh, in, in the profession, in practice, as well as in, in the education and research. However, uh, it's not something that is very new. POE is not very new. And um, if you, if you ref refer to this website, usablebuildings.co.uk, um, you can find a, a, a whole list of different POE methods, uh, which are shown in this diagram here. Um, which have been developed over time, uh, and the problem with, with many of these methods are that they are proprietary techniques, so uh, you probably need a license to, to use them in practice. There might be education version uh, for some of these methods which students can use and test in their, in their educational projects, but if you are planning to use it on, on, uh, on a practice-related project, uh, so you need to buy a license scheme for that. Uh, what these different uh, POE techniques allow is uh, benchmarking. So you can actually compare how your building performs with uh, thousands of other buildings that have been tested using that method. Uh, the issue with benchmarking is that sometimes it, it, it abstracts the building out from its context and so if we are comparing, say, a university building to uh, another university building, uh, the, the institutional context is very different, and the student body is very different. So that creates a lot of problems in terms of how we can compare two different buildings. And the third issue is that the data is not generally shared. So if you are trying to uh, do some research on, on, on the kind of data that has been collected using any of these techniques, because they are proprietary uh, uh, kind of um, uh, techniques, the data is not shared. So, so although there is a good range, there are specific subjects uh, in where uh, there is an issue of agency, so people are thought as passive, and they, don't, they are not allowed to make any changes in that conceptualization. Uh, and also the physical environment is, is given and immutable. So these two kind of issues are, are quite um, critical to the way we think about building and the way we think about performance. Uh, so me and um, Stuart Green and Professor Trading, we have been trying to um, kind of raise this debate um, around rethinking and reconceptualizing buildings and uh, reconceptualizing uh, post-occupancy valuation. So uh, we want to kind of uh, promote uh, performance, which is beyond technical aspect. Um, and uh, the performance criteria needs to be evolved uh, continuously. So if we set a criteria uh, and we keep evaluating buildings for years, 
uh, based, based on, on that criteria so that it allows us to compare different buildings. But then we kind of fail to ask the questions which are relevant uh, to, to that particular exercise or that particular building. And I think uh, the, the issue around, uh, again, building less checks and how can we take into consideration that buildings are adapting and are continuous evolving. So um, if you want one thing from today's presentation, uh, I suggest you take away this. So the conceptual shift. So just think about uh, buildings as not fixed objects, but as continuously emerging in socio-material practices. Now, what is socio-material practices? Uh, it's an interaction between people and material objects, which can be uh, the physical building, walls, uh, floor, windows. But it can be uh, other material objects like a uh, laptop, uh, a Wi-Fi router, or uh, a desk or a chair. So um, this expands the, the boundary of what a building is from just being walls and, and, and slabs and floors to this whole a new arena of different material objects. And by practices, I mean in, in the doings. So when we do something, that's when a building merges. Um, I would expand this because this idea comes from my PhD research, um, and I would expand on this. So my PhD uh, research focused on uh, University of Reading's uh, White Knights Library. That's why I was doing my PhD. And this is a very day-to-day uh, -day building. Um, and it was built in the 1960s, and I was doing field work in 2014, which was almost uh, after 50 years. And I got interested in this question, like what happened uh, in the building after it was built? And if you see these images, um, you, you might think, OK, it hasn't changed as much uh, the physical uh, aspect of the building. However, um, in, on the, in the underneath and behind the walls, there has been so many different changes um, and, uh, and upgrades, IT upgrades, electrical upgrades. Um, but, but also, I think the way students use the building has, has changed uh, drastically. Uh, during my field work, I found that uh, a library is not one thing. A library is many things. Many things. Uh, so, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here the library is a book stack. Uh, it's where you go and find books. Here you can see that the library uh, is a reading space where you can meet up with your friends and, and study. It's like a cafe. Uh, it's it's a place to exhibit events. It's a place where students can protest. Um, it's a place for staff to work. And it's a place for troubleshooting and queries. Um, and it's a place to uh, to kind of promote a uh, university in national student survey, which is uh, quite an important uh, survey in the UK, capturing students' experiences. Um, and it is also statistic in the annual review, how many books are there, how many seats are there, how many staffs are there. So here you can see that the library gets, um, it gets there are different versions of, of what the library is. And I think uh, when we are designing uh, a building, that there is an uh, element of politics involved in terms of which version of that particular building we are leveraging. Studying buildings in use require data, and data of lots of different kinds. And I'm open to both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, Methods of user research, these are the methods that I use uh, in my PhD. So I start off with the building itself. You can see that it offers quite a lot of information, what kind of bricks are used, what kind of um, glasses used, etc. Um, then there are uh, original drawings and archives. Um, I can go and interview people who are using the building, or staff who are working there, or uh, designers who are doing the refurbishment. So interviewing is one of the methods. Um, the, the operational uh, archives, so um, 
the documents which are generated by a building is in operation, for instance, electricity consumption records or um, refurbishment documents. So those can be um, interesting uh, data source for, for uh, understanding how a building is in use. As this was a library, uh, it had, uh, this is a, a screenshot of, of the catalog of the library, and um, it had lots of documents about itself in, in its library, so that is also uh, an, an interesting uh, data source. Uh, by accident, I also found out uh, a series of um, uh, archival documents, which I didn't know they were there when I started my research, as you can see, like, I found hundreds and hundreds of pages of, of um, archival documents uh, pertaining to the library. And not just the building, but also the organization. How did the organization um, kind of grow and evolve over time? And that kind of document, I was tracing the implications for, for the physical building. Um, I, there were refurbishments going on when I was doing my, my field work, and so I got a, a chance to observe um, project meeting of that, of that refurbishment. Um, the library also uh, puts lots of content um, on, its, on its blog uh, in terms of new services and what's going on. So, uh, the books in there, uh, I observed uh, quite a lot, so I, I wrote, and like you can see here, I wrote uh, notes and I would make sketches and observe what's going on. And more archives in different locations, um, and then an exhibition at that point. Um, so this just shows a, a broad range of, of things that, uh, that, that that was collected. Uh, as, as part, part of this, uh, this project. So uh, when, I was, uh, when I was trying to kind of make sense of all the data, um, I tried to trace the practices um, that were going on in this building. And there were three uh, key practices. One was issuing a book, the second was the table, the third was making exhibition, and that don't quite well on the program of the, of the building. Um, so here you can see how book gets issued. So you basically um, uh, scan your barcode, uh, ID card, and then you scan your book. And uh, within the spine of the book, there is a um, um, kind of a tip that you insert it. And when you scan, that tape gets demagnetized. Uh, de so, so when you go past these barriers, uh, here, the gray barriers, uh, if you haven't scanned your book, uh, the, the alarm will sound, and somebody from here, uh, a staff member, would intervene. Now, this, the, the, the reason for showing this is that um, the, the, the walls itself don't provide the boundary for books, uh, for monitoring the books. You need to have this kind of tackle tape here, the barcode, a person sitting here to be observing and intervening to make this building work as a library. Um, so going back to this idea that the building is not a fixed object, but when we start looking into how buildings are used, we, we can see that buildings are actually emerging in, in this kind of practices. The second uh, practice is now making a solution, and you can see here that uh, in the 1960s, when the building opened, uh, they created uh, quite, quite a few exhibitions, but over time, uh, that space was taken up um, by books and, and chairs, uh, which meant that the practice of curating exhibition was lost because there was no space. Uh, however, recently, uh, they have refurbished uh, the, the kind of um, that, that area, area and uh, the space is now available. But there is also an element that the books are now, a lot of books are electronically available. You so don't need a physical copies, which has freed up space. So again, uh, here we can see that the availability of a space in a building kind of linked to this kind of um, a virtual um, 
environment uh, and, and, and a kind of materiality that that virtual environment brings in. So as you can see, this was an exhibition that uh, was curated uh, by me around uh, the 50th anniversary of the building. And we could actually uh, create that library uh, through this exhibition here. Uh, this is a quote uh, from, uh, from a very uh, recent publication of, of, on post-structural evaluation of, uh, of Bristol Business School uh, in, in, in the UK. And one of the recommendations, uh, now this post-structural evaluation isn't carried out by architects, it is being carried out by organizational researchers uh, from the business schools. So that's very interesting. And uh, one, one of the things, uh, 69, uh, there was a student survey, um, and there were 307 survey responses that I found in the archives. So I wanted to understand if the way students use library has changed over time at all. This is a, a screenshot uh, from the furniture use, use study, the sweeping survey. Here you can see that uh, the, the blue dots are where males are sitting, and the, the pink or the red dots is where a, a female is sitting. And uh, the circle is, is, uh, is for recording that the two people were having a conversation. So here you can see that the two people were facing in opposite direction, but still they were talking to each other. So although this is a space for individual studies, students were adapting it for collaborative study. And gathering all this data uh, and analyzing it uh, brought up this kind of uh, visual where you can see that um, the green uh, the, the, the green dots are when the furniture, a particular piece of furniture was, ha was occupied uh, to its maximum capacity. So if there is a table for four, there were three or four people sitting on that table at that particular time. Uh, and what, what it appears is that the library is really busy during 12.30 to, to 6.30. However, it's quieter the, the, in, in, in the morning and the evening. And what we can also see is that uh, there are some furniture equipment which were really popular for students. And then there are equally other furniture elements which were not that popular and students don't want to use that. Uh, if, if we, in, in terms of analyzing occupancy uh, through, um, through the Wi-Fi detection techniques, so here I'm drawing on Lee Shao, who, who is one of my tutors, who was one of my tutors at Reading, and his colleague uh, who used Wi-Fi uh, router uh, and placed them uh, uh, in, in, the, in a particular area, and they found out uh, the patterns of, of usage of that particular space in the library. And they found out four patterns. So the pattern A is uh, somebody oh. just coming in and going out for less than, say, a minute or so. And this is generally a member of staff kind of uh, checking in if everything is all right. Uh, pattern B is somebody staying in for, say, a longer duration, half an hour to one hour for a short span of study. Um, pattern C is that somebody is coming in and going out and coming in and going out at different moments in time. This, again, can be, uh, can be staff and a member uh, making regular checks uh, during, during the day. And pattern D is that somebody is staying in for say one hour, one and a half hour, then going out for a quick break and then returning to, to the space again and then going off for a quick break. So th these are the four patterns of usage that they found out through, through this uh, Wi-Fi detection technique. What it basically does is that if you carry a laptop or, or a mobile phone and it is connected to the Wi-Fi, it will record your presence and that's how it will know that you are there. Um, they were also aware that somebody might carry more than one device, so they had made an adjustment for that. Um, this, through this method, you can collect uh, what we call big data, so lots of data points, and a very speedy data collection, and you would probably need algorithms to analyze this. Uh, 
this can't be done manually. Um, and, but but th there is a difference here. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, the survey questionnaire from the archives and the, the data that that questionnaire collected was what is the time of entry in the building, which department you are studying, what did you do when you come here, did you look at the books, did you use the tables, and what time did you leave? So it kind of collects a bit more of a demographic information, while the Wi-Fi router, uh, Wi-Fi method is, is anonymous in that sense. Um, and uh, there is a free text uh, section in the survey where students can put in their comments and uh, write a bit more about their experiences. Uh, however, in the Wi-Fi detection technique, you probably can't do that. Um, however, what Wi-Fi detection technique offers is high granularity of data and easy data collection once it's set up. And you can collect data over time. So there are benefits and, uh, and limitations of each method. And I think we need to be slightly aware of, of, of this. So th the fourth method of shadowing, uh, which was to hang around with, with library users and write notes and, and do interviews, um, you can see here, this is a field note uh, from, from my shadowing. So I was following two undergraduate students, and so this is a note from that. They begin working, so the students begin working. User one reads notes on user two's laptop. So you can see that two people are sharing one device. User two goes to get some prints, but the laptop still is with user one. Uh, and then the user one goes user two comes back and user one goes and people go and come uh, and the laptop stays still. So say if we were using the Wi-Fi detection technique at this moment, what it would record is that some uh, somebody as a proxy of the laptop was present for one hour. However, in reality, there were two people sharing it and one was going away and coming every now and then. So um, you can see the limitations of, of the Wi-Fi detection technique, uh, but there are limitations of other qualitative methods in terms of we, we don't have resources to do a lot of in-depth qualitative uh, research. So what is at stake when we are selecting a method uh, to study users? Uh, I think um, this idea of ontological politics is, is quite important, and what that means is that when we use a particular method, we are implying a particular way of thinking about buildings. So in this case, framing of buildings as either fixed or fluid. So in sweeping survey, the, the way building was conceptualized was to the seats. If there are seats, that's what is representing the building. Um, and in the Wi-Fi detection techniques, there was no, uh, no presence of seats. It was mainly uh, within those walls, if you're present. So um, we are kind of, um, uh, if we say that we are kind of um, giving more importance to the And um, archival method also then allows us to then connect the past and the present, which means that we can trace the changes that have happened over time, which makes building slightly fluid. Um, and also there is implication for how the users are framed. So in the Wi-Fi detection technique, the user is actually uh, is a proxy here. It's the Wi-Fi device. And it's not the actual person, it's the device. Um, and in seats, for instance, the users can't bring their own seats. So they are seen slightly passive here. Um, so these are, the, these are the issues which uh, are at stake when we are selecting a particular method for user research. So uh, concluding on that, methods are not innocent set of procedures. Uh, they enact and craft realities, the realities of a building, what a building is, the reality of the user, and they are political because we make a, a choice and we, we decide which methods we are going to use. Um, I'm, I'm kind of um, also concerned that a um, lot of times uh, user research um, can be influenced by what I call this a uh, street light effect. So here you can see a boy uh, and he was on a walk and he lost his keys. 
uh, the keys went and fell in the gutter uh, in the dark area of the, of the photograph. There's a gutter there. Uh, however, the boy is looking for the keys uh, where there is the uh, light from the lamppost. So, so interpreting that, uh, we can get carried away by data, and um, which, so we try to kind of search for patterns where there is data available, and we try and we forget what the question was, and and I think. Uh, that is really problematic uh, when it comes to user research. Um, there's also an issue around politics of representation. So when we are doing user research, how are user groups represented? And here you can see a uh, quite um, seminal um, piece of work by uh, Sherry Einstein, which is called Ladder of Citizen Participation. Um, and uh, the degree of, uh, of power increases as when goes from level one to level eight. However, uh, the, the underlying issue, even in this uh, way of conceptualizing participation, is who is being involved, and not just how somebody is being involved. And I think that 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 is really problematic. I'm trying to bring some of these ideas to uh, to the teaching that I do. Uh, at, at, uh, that I did at the University of Reading as well as uh, at Welsh School of Architecture. So I uh, organized this uh, this session uh, with students to to kind of um, explore user research. And these are two comments from the students, and I'll read them. So the first student says the methods of research presented were eye-opening and useful in demonstrating that methods can be developed to measure anything that you want. I think that is really interesting because I want to enable students to think that how can I measure something not being bogged down by a method, but really going and asking the question, what is important and how do I measure that? And uh, the second student says that good and interactive session, the good thing that I liked about this session is its ability to offer forward thinking in gathering data. So making students data savvy, I think, um, for, for them to go and explore uh, what data sets are available and what new data sets they can generate about users. And this is a, this is a plug from, uh, from me uh, to invite you all to come and speak to the, the, the team at, at the school on the topic of building performance if you are interested, not just me, <laughs> you can hear to, to these other experts. And if you search uh, Google Cardiff University Virtual CPD Summer School, you will find details of, uh, of this uh, seminar. So as I know that some of uh, the, the attendees are, are practitioners, and I want to say that user research isn't just something that you do in, in schools and, uh, and academia but it's something which is equally important and can be can give competitive advantage uh, in practice as well. Uh, so my work on uh, the archive of, of the firm DEGW, you remember Frank Duffy from earlier slide, he was one of the co-founders of this firm. And if you are into workplace design uh, sector, uh, you would probably recognize DEGW because they are the kind of uh, one of the uh, biggest influencers of, of workplace design. And uh, what the archive was actually, um, as you can see in this photograph here, it was part of their uh, knowledge center. Uh, and the, when uh, in 1990s, but once it has, it is now part of ACOM, the firm. So the archive has now come to University of Reading, uh, where you can access some of those documents. But these documents were used by practitioners in that firm in their day-to-day -day activities. So they give a glimpse of the practice. One of the, uh, their major projects uh, are, uh, was Broadgate Development in London. It's a huge development near Liverpool Street Station, uh, comprising of many, uh, um, many, many office buildings. Um, it's a regeneration project. Um, and what DGW did uh, was they, they didn't build any buildings. They just provided user research consultancy to the client and the, and the architects on this. 
So you can see that they actually developed a, a, a practice offering of, uh, through user research. Uh, it, this development was uh, was mainly done in 1980s, and at that time, um, trading floors were just coming to to the UK. The large trading floors were coming to the UK, and there was a revolution going on in trading floors where uh, the technology, uh, the wiring and cabling, was coming up and and uh, assisting with communication. So. What Broadgate clients wanted to do was to design buildings which can accommodate this technological change. And what DGW did was to do user research in terms of how people use technology, what kind of, uh, what are the requirements of different uh, organizations, and how can this be incorporated into the building design. So they produced a series of reports uh, over the course of, of almost a, a decade. Uh, and they are listed here. And some of these reports were at the scale of, of the urban, uh, so regional scale, uh, not regional, sorry, urban scale, uh, neighborhood. Uh, and then some reports actually at the level of uh, furniture layout. So you can see that they were spanning user research across different scales. And if you want to read more about uh, their, their work on this, uh, I've put a note of a publication which we recently did uh, kind of capturing uh, all the user research that DGW did for, for this Broadgate development. Uh, one of the ideas uh, that, that DGW is quite known for is this, uh, is this notion of building as layers. And I think this, again, brings in the fluidity into, into play. And I think if you start focusing on users, you tend to move away from the idea of building this fixed object and more kind of incorporating uh, uh, the kind of fluidity of, of the building. So uh, here you can see that shell is the outer kind of um, structure, and then services and scenery is more like partitions and settings are the day-to-day -day kind of furniture layout. And the design decisions regarding shell should be ideally separate from the design decisions around settings so that it gives some adaptability to, to the building. If everything is connected at these different layers, uh, the building becomes really rigid and difficult to adapt. Uh, the EGW used that expertise to relate a range of different organizations to physical space, uh, technology companies, university hospitals, and how each of this firm uh, was like, each of the sector was slightly different in the way they used buildings. So here, um, this is a diagram from Frank Duffy's PhD. And uh, he, in, I think it's in 19, yeah, 1975. And his He's characterizing organizations based on interaction and bureaucracy. So if an organization is highly bureaucratic, uh, it's probably going to be, um, to be something like what you can see on the top corner of the right-hand side, uh, because there will be less differentiation and there will be a level of surveillance. So you know there is power hierarchy kind of embedded within, within the physical building. Uh, however, if the bureaucracy is low and the interaction is low, which um, uh, you can see here on the bottom corner of the left-hand side, it's more cellular, like uh, probably how it happens in, in uh, legal firms. Um, so that, that is the idea of how physical space and organizations connect, and they connect at these three levels. One is efficiency. Uh, the other is effectiveness, and the third is expression. And I think the expression is now becoming more and more important uh, in terms of how can a building communicate organizational, uh, organizational meanings and build a culture um, for that organization. And if you see the realities of working today, it's, it's dispersed. And um, we work from lots of different places. We are not stuck to office, and currently we all are working from home, uh, and which is bringing us to, uh, which is a, a kind of a legacy of, of knowledge economy because we are not making uh, things in a factory. We are actually uh, sharing and trading knowledge uh, here.
So DGW uh, used some of these uh, techniques to redesign their own offices, and here you can see the, the impact of knowledge economy on, on, the, on the architectural design. Uh, they came up with the six um, user types, the nomadic worker, the team resident, independent, visitor, and manager. And each of these had a different requirement. So generally, the, the senior management uh, were, were nomadic in the sense they, they were never in their cabins. Uh, they were always out consulting with clients, yet they used quite a lot of floor space in the building. Uh, so they, what the DGW did was then to not give them a, a cabin uh, and to break that hierarchy uh, and, and say, we will share the space with other people. So there is an element of organizational change here, the way an organi organization functions, and then that is reflected in the physical building. We can also see this uh, in, in the current working from home the, the impact of knowledge economy, which is allowing us to kind of work from home uh, in, during lockdown. But then there are some serious issues here, uh, which is emerging from the interviews that I'm doing. Um, one is of sense of time. So we are losing uh, a sense of how long we have been sitting in this place. <laughs> um, I have been talking for an hour, and uh, it's, it's kind of um, we tend to work more, or, or we, we kind of start losing a sense of freedom. Um, we are comforted in terms of are we at work or are we at home, and uh, things like having this background here uh, is, is kind of trying to create my identity of uh, being at work, really, presenting myself as being at work. Um, we are also negotiating physical and non-physical territories with home members. So um, a lot of times when I am doing a, a meeting or a seminar, uh, my family members switch off Wi-Fi uh, from their devices so that I get most of the bandwidth. So we are negotiating this non-physical territory of bandwidth and also the physical space. Um, healthy eating, being more at home is kind of helping us to eat more healthy, be, uh, allowing us to exercise. and. Um, the biggest struggle, I think, is coping with, uh, with uh, technologically mediated interactions, but that offers new possibilities like this webinar. So uh, the, the way um, we are working has changed drastically over time, uh, and I think that has implications in the physical spaces and, and the design of workplace and homes. Um, future challenges. So I think for me, one of the biggest challenge for future is how we link user research and design, uh, not just in academia and in practice. And uh, I want to uh, unpack this with, uh, with uh, three, three of the kind of um, uh, themes. First one is research in practice. Uh, and we probably need uh, new organizational models for architectural practice to enable people to, to uh, consult and do research and inform the design based on evidence and research. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of uh, OMA and AMO. Uh, these are the, the practices that are by Ram Kulhas. And this is a quote from him. So OMA and AMO are like CMS twins. They were recently separated. The separation enables us to liberate architectural thinking from architectural practice. So OMA is mainly focusing on designing of new buildings, and AMO, you can see the mirror reflection, is, is focusing on the research. So REM has been able to kind of bring the two together. Uh, the second theme is around uh, dialogue between supply and demand. And by supply, uh, I mean the construction industry, the AC sector, uh, the design and construction industry. And demand, I mean clients. And one of the ways of probably doing this is by setting up client forums. And this is an idea which DGW uh, developed. Um, I, ha I have been uh, recently involved with, uh, with a client forum called Higher Education Design Quality Forum. Uh, where, who bring together stakeholders from the higher education sector in, involving um, universities, uh, architects, uh, contractors, uh, student bodies. And we, we did this, uh, this um, project where we were scoping 
uh, where future research needs to focus uh, in terms of learning environments and how can we better relate uh, learning with, uh, with space. Um, and this is the outcome from, from the scoping exercise, which was uh, tracing the research themes going forward in the future. And this might be of relevance to the educators uh, joining us today. Uh, so the higher education models in the UK, uh, and I think even in India, there is um, an emerging market for uh, massive open access and of courses, MOOCs and um, online learning. And how is that going to impact higher education? The impact of AI and robotics uh, on learning methods uh, if we are designing using AI and, and robotics. Uh, we will probably need spaces in the university to be able to uh, let students learn that. Um, and uh, shifting focus from teaching to learning, I think it's more student-centered approach to, uh, to learning and, and then implications for spaces based on that. Uh, diversity within HE sector, diversity of student bodies. There are mature students who are working part time and coming to the degree. Uh, there are students who have different cultural backgrounds, but also there are different academic disciplines which require different sorts of spaces. And it's about, also about how we value higher education. So in UK, for instance, a lot of universities are trying to uh, focus on their civic purpose uh, and their commitments to the local community, which means that there are implications for physical environments and making them uh, kind of accessible for local communities. So uh, these are the broad themes which, uh, which we probably need to do more research on going forward. And the, the Learning Space Compass, the toolkit which emerged from that project, uh, is basically a toolkit which allows uh, academics to speak with designers to come up with uh, to come up with uh, attributes of space that can link learning. Uh, so, for instance, if a lot of a uh, lot of learning activities are revolving around uh, observing and listening, what kind of spaces do we need? And if some of the activities are revolving around analyzing and communicating out to public, we probably need different sorts of spaces. So again, I have put the links here, or if you Google HEDQF Learning Space Compass, you will find references uh, to, to this particular document. Um, the third challenge is, is going back to where we started this, uh, this presentation uh, and, and the statement that was put up in the seminar series banner around architecture as interdisciplinary practice. And I think we need new concepts and new tools uh, to enable us to think differently about, uh, about buildings and users. And um, it is indeed interdisciplinary because uh, we can draw from environmental psychology, sociology, anthropology, and now I will add computer science because of the prevalence of big data. Um, I would like to end with this quote, uh, which is that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we are in, indeed in need of new ideas. Uh, thank you for listening. And um, I don't know if you have any questions, but I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hiro Patel. It was a great session indeed. And uh, probably we all were uh, got more into how building performance evaluation um, becomes a mode of, uh, you know, uh, doing a building user, uh, uh, user friendly and knowing it in detail about how um, any building could be, you know, uh, at the time it was built, um, uh, how was it portrayed and then slowly and steadily how the changes happened and the end product you have is, uh, you know, uh, to all the diverse changes which has, you know, in terms of the physical and the um, non-physical elements. So, uh, 
I think it, uh, it gave us an insight about uh, how uh, uh, a building would give us more, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of its uh, uh, usage, in terms of the space. Um, you know, it, it, busts, it opens a lot of relevance for us uh, to understand the space uh, within uh, framework. And uh, um, moreover, uh, this webinar also gave us an insight about uh, um, how the uh, user research can be helpful for practitioners and uh, academicians. Yes, it is uh, there uh, to it can be a part of an academic overall. And then uh, for a practitioner or for an architect, it is platform which you know definitely will help them improve the uh, um, way of uh, designing a building for a better sense. So um, thank you uh, for uh, giving us such a good, great presentation. Really, madam, I would like to add something. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Quite a lot in green architecture and sustainability buildings from the point of view of evaluation of the building. Pallav ma'am, your, your voice was not audible. You can start again. Hello. 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 Hello, ma'am. We, we can hear you. Yes, Pallavi. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you now. I think she is having a internet issues. Rohini, ma'am. Uh, yes, I'm here. Hello. Hello. Yes. We yes. can hear you. Yes. Uh, she is having probably some issues. She was mentioning about um, sustainable uh, building design and um, the evaluation are, are kind of quite key yeah. to, to yeah. sustainable yes. building design. And uh, one of the one of the problems with, uh, oh, with oh, the evaluations oh, that are being done for energy efficient uh, no, buildings. Yeah, well, yeah. um, tend to focus on, on the technical oh, aspects okay. only. And a lot of times they assume that by installing ah, all okay. these features, uh, we will achieve sustainability. However, there is a growing body of evidence which is showing that even passive design houses um, cannot uh, achieve the desired performance um, if the occupant behavior is not being considered. So, the, so I think if, if, if the emphasis on is on sustainable uh, building design, we probably need uh, a qualitative understanding of user behavior in in uh, in that context to ensure that the kind of design that we are doing uh, is is kind of uh, materializes in practice. And there is a term called performance gap, and you will find lots and lots of literature around uh, this term performance gap. 
which is essentially the gap between designed performance and the actual performance of the building when it's in operation. So uh, we have found that it's not the same. We can design to an optimum performance, but when it's in use, uh, we, we are not being able to achieve that, that performance. Um, so I think um, user research is really critical in, in that context. Uh, well, I'm here guessing what Pallavi's question might be, but I hope this kind of, um, this brings out a, a different point, I think. So um, yeah, thanks Pallavi. Thank you, Nidal. Uh, I think um, maybe probably uh, she was pointing out the same, I guess. Uh, here we have uh, one more question. Can that's building, perform uh, building performance evaluation in future design? In the sense you would always, it, uh, you already have at risk something done. Uh, sorry, you were breaking up. So am I? Did I hear it right? That how building performance evaluation can inform future design? Is that what? Yeah. You're yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, building performance evaluation is quite critical. I think uh, for future design. And as you can see from the example of the GW, uh, they used uh, user research uh, to inform the design of this uh, big regeneration project, Broadgate in London. And it was quite successful. And I think uh, what that what that really does is that it brings value to the organization who is going to occupy it. And um, if you look at workplace sector, there are lots of uh, organizations who provide just research consultancy to clients uh, in terms of selecting which building will be best for their organization. They are called real estate firms here in the UK, and they they understand, they kind of do research on uh, how a building is affecting health and well-being of individuals, how it is affecting productivity of individuals. So, and then they take on those findings and uh, feed that into the briefing process for for new projects. Uh, so I think unless and until, if you take the example of uh, how um, softwares are developed, there is a continuous engagement uh, with users and there's a whole field of user experience within software development. Uh, I just am curious why we don't have similar kind of um, consultancy within architecture where we kind of um, focus on user experience and uh, and inform that uh, in the buildings, in the design of the buildings. I think it's it's really, uh, from my point of view, uh, and I think there's lots of other organizations, uh, architectural uh, and, and uh, real estate organizations who would completely agree that um, building performance evaluation feeds into the future designs by taking forward the lessons learned and the failures and learning from mistakes and improving that in subsequent design. Um, I, I can see a question here is that um, this term of user behavior would really be very helpful. I think it's a comment uh, would be really helpful for building design. And I think uh, yes, because we need to, um, I have seen this comment in uh, I think it, in, in uh, a, a publication by Bill Bordas, uh, who is, is one of the co-founders of the Usable Building uh, Trust, the website I put uh, in my presentation. And he said that, why do we always take photographs of the building without any people in them? Why are the spaces always empty? And why is it never raining in the photographs we take of buildings which are published in architectural magazine? And I think that shows the heart of the problem because we feel that focus should be on on the just on the visual the aesthetic i don't under uh, underestimate aesthetic that is very very important but what i'm i'm trying to bring in here is that uh, users are equally important and um, without users uh, in my view there is no building uh, it will be a ruin 
uh, which is which is in decline. So I think user behavior and the idea of user is very very important. Hello. 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 Ben. I am Pallavi Mardle, working in the Indian Institute. Yeah. Ma'am, I would like to ask one uh, different question regarding the same uh, research addressing uh, address user performance in building design. So, how the user performance can redefine the economic aspect of the software? Economical aspect of the society. Economical aspect of the society. Of the society, is that right? Yes. 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 So, um, I think um, if I if I take that example, I mean, um, users, the, the, there is a value associated with uh, with buildings, and if I take an example of say a museum, uh, and I know. Vadodara Museum quite well uh, and similarly there are lots of museums here and if we if we kind of don't focus on how people are using those buildings uh, in this case a, a public sector cultural uh, building we are actually losing out on the contribution it can make to the economy in the sense um, it can generate new revenues through events. It can it can kind of help a, in creating learning opportunities, which would have in economic implications for the community. So, um, in that sense, the user performance. I, I, I'm fairly confused about the term user performance because actually it's about users in buildings and building performance. So, um, in that sense, user research uh, and kind of. Going back to that example uh, from business school's case study, to have somebody uh, appointed as a curator of the building, as 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 uh, a custodian of uh, culture and behavior in building, uh, we'd bring in uh, a perspective where there will be more value emerging out of the asset rather than just having an empty space which is not being utilized to its maximum but also i think um there is an another economic aspect here of, uh, of operational costs of buildings so if we design buildings uh, without really thinking about its life cycle how users are going to use it over 10 years 15 years down the line and a lot of times we find that capital costs uh, there is a, an impetus to reduce the capital cost and uh, and kind of um, which has implications uh, for having higher running costs of building. So that that that, that is the direct connection uh, in terms of building itself, in terms in terms of running costs. So I think uh, there is that broader societal element, but there is also that uh, particular building level element of operational cost, which is quite uh, key when we when we are thinking about uh, user research. Uh, I see a question here is, uh, to what extent POE is relevant in country India with respect to urban planning? And I think that the question has two parts, the relevance of POE to India. And I think it's, it's highly relevant because the rate at which new buildings are being built in India is, 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 um, is massive. So the, the possibility of uh, creating a, a sustainable kind of a built environment in India is great. And I think it would be a missed opportunity for the country as a whole if we are kind of uh, not taking some of these uh, issues into consideration, uh, especially to do with uh, building performance and user research. Uh, I know that there are some research initiatives uh, in India focusing on um, technical aspects of building performance in housing. However, um, I feel uh, that we probably need a, a more qualitative understanding because there are cultural issues, there are, um, um, I think, individual household structures which are very different, which impact the, the way uh, a building is used. So, 
from my point of view, uh, POE is very relevant to India, and I would urge more and more people uh, to get involved in this topic, uh, both from practice and research. Uh, and what is the connection to urban planning? I mean, if we see the example of working, we are no longer working in an office. We are working in, uh, in, in different locations. We are distributed, uh, so to say, uh, and dispersed. So uh, the office is the city, so to say. So if we start focusing on, on the activities, we can trace uh, the user experience and uh, and the use of space across uh, the the different spatial scales. So one might think that the term building performance is means that performance is just a matter for a building level uh, scale. However, I would disagree because uh, the building is more and more fluid. And if you take the idea of building as a socio material practice, uh, the material could be beyond. Uh, the, the the walls of the building, it could be how my office connects to my home. So it's a whole urban issue as well. So um, I think it, it is it is very relevant to urban planning. Um, I have uh, some question from Pallavi Mahida. Uh, I was trying to say that POE we knew was for buildings and now for after this session, the POE for user satisfaction is so much important for the building to be really successful. In academia, uh, we stress on user analysis and totally I'm happy that your presentation has shown the analysis so much in this. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, how do you, yeah, I think we have addressed the question of how it affects the economical aspect of the, of the society. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if uh, there are any more questions. Um, I wanted to know a bit more about um, what are your experiences of user research. Um, there's a question here, and meanwhile, if somebody wants to talk about if they have done any user research and how it went, I, I would be really keen to hear, hear that. Um, so I'll take this question. Considering how important empathy is in architecture, how should researchers go about convincing architectural practices to do uh, to adopt uh, design research or ethnography. I mean, this question goes back to some of the sections in my presentation, which were talking about how user research can bring competitive advantage to uh, to your service. So, if you are, I mean, Rem Kulhas is uh, one of the most prominent um, architecture architects, and uh, he has set up this whole. A division in his uh, in his practice, which focuses uh, on user research, not just at urban scale, but at scale as well. Uh, I think it, it it gives a competitive advantage. So if there is a tendering process, and uh, if uh, you are presenting <coughs> your client uh, or your kind of proposal to your client based on evidence, that would be really more convincing. However, we have to be cautious about evidence because all evidence is political and we need to make sure that uh, we do our best to represent uh, the evidence we have got. So um, I think uh, we probably need forward thinking architectural practices who are open uh, to, to research and who, uh, who value uh, the, the evidence-based uh, approach to design, and um, I think it, th there is a lot of uh, kind of um, uptake for for research within UK within architectural practices, um, and um, I would give here a shout out to Flora Samuel, who I worked with, and she was vice president of research uh, by RI at RIBA. And maybe we probably need a vice president of research in Council of Architecture to promote research to architecture profession and practices. She did amazing work um, in the UK to bring uh, to bring the value of research to practice. So probably we need uh, influencers like that within the professional bodies to, to help um, help change the direction of the profession.
I don't know if anybody wants to talk about um, their experience of, of doing user research. If anyone would want to share their experience, they can type in their chat box. If you guys have any more questions. Hi, Hiro. Hello. I'm sorry I joined you. I'm Shishin Rawal. Um, hi, hi, thanks for sharing your research and your passion with the audience. Uh, I was typing the message in the chat, in the chat box, but I, it disappeared. I don't know why, so I thought that I'll speak. Uh, it is my observation having taught and stayed in the U.S. for nearly 20 years and having come back here that uh, apart even starting with the BRK education onwards, there is very little understanding of what research is and how it should be conducted. Uh, I'm not talking about any particular school or any particular individual here. I'm generally talking that the culture of research is kind of not well established here in India, especially in the built environment professions uh, and particularly in architecture. I mean, there are journals who publish so-called research and there is some movement going on and I do appreciate that. Uh, but post-occupancy post or post-implementation evaluation is a rich field that almost any office can with simple understanding and tools can conduct for their own projects can shed so much of new light on existing knowledge and can propel practice in a different direction. And at the same time, both at the school level as well as in the professional practice world, there is very little culture of scholarship. Um, scholarship by, by which I mean uh, writing what you learn, sharing what you learn in whatever fora. That is also weak. And the third point that is weak is we are very weak in making or taking criticism yeah. here in India. Uh, we we glorify or we appease people and don't talk critically about anybody. Uh, so those three para those three things together, uh, the lack of understanding of re research and conducting it, lack of scholarship and lack of critical uh, dialogue or critical uh, writing is all these three things have created an inertia in my observation in the field of architecture and other built and disciplines. It is changing gradually, I'm not denying that, but by and large the culture is still celebrating practice more than generation of knowledge. Thank you. I, I thank you, sir. Um, it's great to hear from you. Um, and um, I just want to uh, mention that uh, it was great to study uh, with you um, and also work for you. I think I, I did a short, uh, short work project with you. And I think you the points you mentioned are going straight to the heart of the problem because um, the, the research culture is is is, is, is a big issue um, because I think we don't understand the value of of research and how to how to do it and um, I completely agree that there is a separation between uh, research and and practice um, but but I hope that more and more people do crossover so for instance. Um, in UK, there is a, a government-funded uh, training scheme called Knowledge Transfer Partnership, uh, in which uh, uh, a student, um, a recent graduate, uh, is part-funded by an organization and part-funded by the government to sit between the university and organization to solve a problem within organization drawing from the research in, in the academia. So, I think um, th th there can be mechanisms uh, to help uh, embed some of this culture, and I think um, the government has an important role uh, to, to play in this. Um, the second issue around 
scholarship, uh, sharing knowledge and writing. I mean, I talked about DGW um, firm here, and they hardly built any buildings. Uh, they yet all of them were architects, and uh, one of the collection we have got is of Frank Duffy. Now Frank Duffy was a president of Royal Institute of British Architect, and he was never directly involved in, you know, designing buildings. What he was doing was writing. He wrote so much, and there is a whole collection of his books and papers. Uh, uh, on, on research, uh, and um, I think writing is a very important skill along with uh, with visualization. Um, and I think we need to share knowledge. And if, I will draw on DGW's example because that might um, inspire some practitioners. What they did was they used this knowledge sharing quite smartly as a PA exercise with clients. So what they did was they created this client forums where they would invite all the possible clients um, in, in a particular sector and they would say, we are going to present you our latest research. And clients highly valued that. Um, so I think um, there is an element of raising client awareness as well here uh, and creating that pool for, for research. Um, which I hope uh, some forward-looking clients uh, would would be quite keen on this. Um, if if you can demonstrate uh, in some way that this building is going to bring you um, this million of more revenue, the clients will surely be interested in that in that economic return. But I think more and more clients are uh, are having troubles with uh, turnover, people leaving the company, and um, loss of, of um, human capital and I think as more and more we move towards knowledge economy clients would be really concerned about this so how can uh, building be one of the uh, tools to attract talent and retain talent I think um, is, is going to be uh, a challenge that clients will face and if the architectural practices are equipped with addressing those issues I think clients would appreciate that very much and I think criticism, um, that, 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 is a, that is a very interesting one. And I think um, most of the architectural criticism that goes on uh, is around the aesthetic, um, around the language of, uh, of uh, the built form. Uh, my issue with criticism is that the criticism never addresses uh, performance issues. Um, so if a building has is recently designed and publicized as this uh, uh, green building, uh, well, what uh, what are what is the performance gap? Is it performing as it was designed? Um, a lot of certifications are being done at design stage, and I think only recently have this uh, certification organizations like LEED and and, and Brian have started to certify buildings once they are in use because they have understood that the design performance uh, is not achieved in practice. So um, I think criticism is a difficult one, but what I would say is that we probably need to start, uh, if it's in academia, a movement of criticism around performance to bring some of these issues around users and uh, sustainability to, to the foreground. So um, I, I very much appreciate this, all these three comments, and I think um, I hope uh, that um, we can work together to 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 kind of make make some change to this. Um, Thanks, Cyril, for your feedback. I mean, for your response. Uh, large part of uh, responsibility also falls on the academia. On the academia, we have 400 or about 400 plus 500 schools. And they have their mandate to pro create first professional degree, profession, uh, first pro provide first professional de degree to their students. And uh, uh, the weakness starts with the BRK education, in my general observation, because we do not normally, I have not seen the practice of inquiry guided learning at the BRK level. Design thesis studios, teachers, 
who are teaching now when they were students of Rupa, they were also given a design studio kind of handout where they will give they will be given program and site and all that instead of asking them to suggest a site defend evidence based defense of their site by that site is particularly important for city city in the city or in the community and what kind of intervention is necessary what should be the program of it that to put the onus on inquiry on part of the student is not adequately practiced and that is foundation means we students do not want to take the risk of making their own decisions inquiring on their own what is right what is the way to approach and that might be one of the major reasons why the foundations are weak towards research uh, scholarship and uh, criticism i'll not belabor the point i'll just say that the uh, post occupant evaluation is something that architecture academia can teach and also offices can have their own unit uh, i also know a few practices in the us when i was there where research was a very much a part of the professional practice in the in those offices and they had they have published quite a good bit of work there so uh, i would just want to ask a question to 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 maybe you sir and and other people it is what is the role of council of architecture in approving uh, syllabuses and is there like a scope for for that organization to mandate uh, education of post occupancy evaluation within the syllabuses in the school of architecture so maybe uh, person nayar if he is there can answer this question better but my in my observation the the schools have the freedom to offer a particular course called research methods so i do not i have not seen the council document in the last 4 5 6 years now that i i stepped down from leadership in 2016 uh, but whatever i recall is that there is a flexibility in terms of uh, schools individually to act accommodate few other courses other than prescribed those by coa uh, it is not just the subject matter it is not that research or poe is introduced it is also the 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 culture of inquiry that is also if they talk <laughs> yes I, i think um the the culture can be um can be a tricky one and I, what I, i was hoping that by making small changes we can uh, we can build a culture i guess um but i completely agree um that we it need it to change the culture right it needs but the proper culture talk mm-hmm. Okay yeah so I, I couldn't hear the last bit but you know thank you for for raising raising those points uh, shishu sir you know because i joined late i am going to bother you with short question uh, mm-hmm. if you can if you covered it i would like you to answer in a brief in in i mean i will hope that you will be able to answer briefly uh the question is in your research related to participants uh, re- uh responses to climate control related or other other that you are studying were there any aha moments were there were there any moments where your research findings yielded or gave an insight into in, in say for example making the obvious dubious or dubious very obvious were there any aha moments uh, or what were the aha findings mainly i think for me uh, my most aha moment was um, because i am trained as an architect i used to think uh, a building is something you know which you design as this form <laughs> a, a, a structure and my biggest aha moment was when i did my phd field work uh, looking at Uh, a very day-to-day library building, um, and not so much um, architecturally inspired. It's great, but it's not that iconic architectural building. And for me, it was like 
wow, what have users done with this thing over 50 years? I mean, they have um, used this building in this building in such a creative way. And I think I was struck by the creativity of users and their kind of um, the, the, their kind of ingenuity in in uh, making spaces work for what they want to do. And I think that was my biggest aha moment, which shifted me uh, to appreciating uh, users uh, so much uh, because I think it just made me feel that uh, as designers, we can design whatever we like and um, we can give it away to to the users and they would do something really different with that and, and create some amazing experiences out of out of that space. Um, and even sometimes they would uh, uh, dismantle the building and um, redo something else. So I think that is my biggest aha moment, I think, uh, the creativity and ingenuity of users. Thank you. There is a book called How Buildings Learn. It is now about 30, 25 years old, or maybe long older. But that book also was one of the earlier books where the how users adapt the building to their needs. So and it was a tongue-in-cheek kind of title, How Buildings Learn. It, mm -hmm. it is more how people yes. learn. <laughs> and I think uh, that book was inspirational when I started off uh, my PhD, Stuart Brand, and he was talking about this example of MIT, uh, a building uh, in yes. MIT's campus where yes. it's very uh, mundane, um, down, you know, ru almost at the verge of ruining uh, state, ruined state. Yet students love it because they what they want is they want some um, some built form which they can change and adapt and and do creative things. So um, users love that, and I think Stuart Brand wrote that book, How Buildings Learn, in a shipping container because he just thought this is amazing. He can take a big wall of the shipping container and put lots of stuff in there and try to visualize what he's writing. So um, yeah, I mean, how creative are users, right? <laughs> Uh, so I think uh, one of the comments in in the comment boxes that COA TRC program is taking initiative in addressing research in architecture, um, and um, we, where we have joined and started addressing from second year studio onwards uh, lessons. So probably research in architecture is part of, of COA, and I think. Um, there is that, I think what you were saying, she, she, she said there is that scope um, to, to engender some of the inquiry-based uh, uh, approach to designing uh, as part of that. But I would still, uh, sometimes we probably need prescriptive approach and we need to be mandatory. And I think some of the things uh, we can, we can probably make them prescriptive and mandatory saying, uh, you needs to be taught as a subject, so that starting point, I guess, uh, for for that broader kind of uh, approach. Uh, but I, I'm just we have to be cautious that it doesn't become a tick boxing exercise. I think um, with the continuous kind of uh, refreshing of knowledge is important. Here, this uh, Professor Maida Ma'am is trying to say something, and she wants you to answer. I think you just have to scroll up. There's a question. Oh. How do I explain the age? Um, yes, uh, I see. Yes. Um, how do you uh, how do you explain the age temporality? Because buildings do get old, and technologies are changing very fast. Um, I think I would go back to uh, to the idea of the GW where buildings were thought of as layers, and I think that is one of the sophisticated way of thinking about about buildings. Um, 
the, the, the other idea which I proposed was around buildings as emerging in socio-material practices is, is kind of also addressing that. Uh, both of them assume that there are some elements of buildings which are going to last longer than the other elements, for instance, the outer shell or, uh, or, or the walls and slab. And I think uh, things inside are going to change on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a different time scales. A building is not a monolithic with, um, with, with a given time frame. There, there are layers. And I think uh, we probably want to design buildings which are being capable of adapting um, to technology because technology is mainly at sometimes at services level or at, 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 the, at the settings level and I think if that is detached from the from the core and the shell of the building that probably helps to create more adaptable uh, adaptable buildings um, and I think thinking about building as socio-material practices I think that just shows that sometimes um, the, 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 this is an example um, when in the library's case when students uh, when the technology evolved and students were no longer just using books but they were also using laptops and computers there was suddenly this need to have uh, electrical sockets everywhere in the building so that students can charge their laptops and i know there were some ideas there where they were saying oh instead of installing sockets everywhere in the building can we just give students uh, charged laptops. Uh, so we are trying to address a, a problem not by refurbishing the building, but by bringing in a different object or different material object into the discussion. And I think now those sockets are not used as much because the students charge their laptops at home. They never bring laptops. They either use their mobile phones or they use uh, their iPads, which are already charged. Um, and now then they probably need USB sockets to charge things rather than a, a, a plug socket. So I think technologies change and, and uh, the answer to that change should not always be a refurbishment in the building. I think there can be other ways uh, which has nothing to do with, uh, with building design uh, and can be solved uh, by, by, by other approaches. Uh, so, as, as architects, I think we need to broaden our palette from just focusing on building and not, and not from not just focusing on building to how we can tweak virtual space or how we can tweak um, um, organizational practices or policy of using a building and still achieve what we want to achieve. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Max. Really nice of you. Yeah, thank you, Pallavi, ma'am, uh, for. Interesting issue. I mean, asking uh, relevant question about uh, our building performance. Uh, as we uh, share a common platform or history of architecture and then how does it you know so uh, thank you ma'am uh, for the question you posted here and um, uh, um, if uh, others have uh, any question or any suggestions uh, you could post or you could ask questions uh, as it is now in open forum. Um, rest, I think, uh, I think I would just like to mention, uh, because we were talking about um, um, how we can engender a research culture uh, within academia, uh, especially in schools of architecture. Um, I want to just draw some examples from WSA, um, Cardiff University. Uh, so we have started this MSc in Advanced Building Performance Evaluation. And um, what we are trying to do is bring together um, the social and technical aspects of, of 
uh, building performance. And it's interesting that um, the course isn't just popular amongst uh, architects, but it's more and more services engineers, uh, building services organizations uh, that are interested in this course because they are developing uh, a service offering around building performance to clients. So maybe uh, there is that uh, element of, um, of, of collaboration with different professions. Um, uh, which uh, which is also important and i think uh, at master's level i'm also involved in a, a, a design unit which uh, focuses on uh, research a uh, design by research and research by design both ways um and i think that th that is also quite critical because what they are um, asked to do is not just create uh, a built form, but they are also asked to consult with the stakeholders, consult with, with local community and bring that into the design project. So that is mandated by the brief that educators set for, for the students. So maybe this is something which, uh, which can be seen as an example of how educators can, uh, can do to, to engender the research culture because brief is a very powerful tool a project brief and, and that could be used to start uh, or, or to uh, enable new thinking with, within uh, within students i think uh, i see a comment here which says that some schools are addressing the gaps with electives instead of going through the trouble of bringing a change in the syllabus uh, I think that's that's a great initiative uh, to do. Uh, but uh, what I was kind of alluding to is that if, if if something is mandatory and prescriptive, it gets a different importance. And probably there is a danger of it becoming, uh, uh, you know, a boring tick box a tick box exercise. But um, I think. It, it, there, there needs to be because research is so important and uh, the the knowledge based profession the idea of that is so important i think it probably needs if not in the syllabus but at least it probably needs uh, to be brought on on a on a higher platform uh, and and been given prominence i think uh, through through both the professional body uh, the government uh, and and then probably academia and practices can can get inspired by that. Um, there's, a, there's a question by Professor Mukul uh, to know gender-based user important decisions. Um, yes, I mean, um, I would draw the, uh, some of my observations from my ongoing research on working from home during COVID-19 crisis. And um, that is what I'm observing is there is a big uh, difference in, in the way um, uh, certain uh, females are, are kind of um, issues that they are facing uh, in the sense that they are responsible for a lot of uh, caring and, and domestic responsibilities which causes uh, them to difficulties for them to balance work and, 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 um, and uh, home responsibilities and um, it, it also, I think uh, gender is also quite critical when it comes to thermal comfort because um, the, the, there are a lot of um, uh, literature around how uh, the differences, the physiological differences between male and female and uh, their preferences for, for thermal comfort. And um, a lot of times uh, we see that um, Ladies are putting on their sweaters while uh, while male counterparts are fairly okay with with the air conditioning temperatures. I think um, there there are there are certain physiological uh, differences um, which play a part in in comfort. And um, yeah, I mean uh, the the feeling uh, the the other aspect of gender is also the feeling of security and safety. So in my library study. I, I did observe that uh, certain uh, female group uh, would would prefer a, a particular location which was more visible 
uh, uh, during the evenings uh, when, when the library is quiet so that they, they feel a sense of security. So, however, I, I wouldn't, um, because for me, gender is not something which is fixed and given. I think gender is more kind of um, enacted as well. Uh, and um, I, I, I would take a slight step back in terms of generalizing a few things, uh, saying this is how females prefer versus how males prefer. And I would let, uh, uh, I would rather go on individual basis and personality types uh, or, um, here. And um, I know that there are imbalances between genders, but um, they, they, are, they are kind of separate issues there. But there's also this idea that gender is is, is a more kind of enacted rather than, than a given. So I'm, I'm aware of that canon as well. And I would be slightly kind of taking a step back here and, and think about them as individuals and their individual preferences. I think uh, we have a question here uh, by Shweta. Uh, some schools are addressing these gaps with the help of electives instead of going through the trouble of bringing a change in this case. Yes, uh, I think um, there is a subsequent uh, comment, uh, which is um, that um, that it wasn't enough to bring out the change in the culture or the mindset towards research. So I think uh, Shishisa's comment, uh, following comment, is that uh, he tried to uh, to create an elective, um, and however he felt that it wasn't sufficient to bring about the change that is required in the mindset. Uh, so, and I think I tried to address that that um, sometimes we probably need to be more prescriptive. Uh, rather than uh, than being like elective, uh, where it's optional, because that just shows that it's probably not that important. Uh, I guess uh, if it's it's mandatory and it's um, it's embedded within the core of the syllabus, then uh, then that shapes the thinking quite strongly versus it being something which one of the things which I did. So my module, I have a module uh, called Perspectives on Performance. And um, it, it is offered as an optional module to uh, design students. Um, and it's interesting that they, they were part of this module. And I made them do an exercise where I asked them to kind of um, reflect on their design and think, what would they change now that they know more about performance? And they, they, had, they had come up with the, some interesting ideas. But I would be really interested to see if what they learned in that module, if they applied it in their design projects, that uh, in the uh, you know, studio project later on. And that's my intention uh, next year, I think, to kind of see if they are applying the knowledge to actual design, because that's where uh, we can see um, a change. And I think in, sometimes students have difficulties in transferring learning from one module, especially if they are more theoretical or more kind of, um, you know, slightly tangent, to bring that knowledge into the design process. And I think uh, if it's elective, uh, we probably need to make sure that it's then embedded into their core thinking and not just as something they do. Uh, for one term uh, and then forget about it. So um, I can sympathize that uh, with Shishin sir that the elective failed to bring about that culture because I think um, I agree that we probably need constant reminders that you know this is important and this is how we do things. I think it's also the way of doing, not just the way of thinking. And if we constantly do something, and I'm a believer in doing, if we constantly do something, then we can probably reshape uh, the way we think. Uh, it's a two-way process, I think. Um, so maybe that is something which um, educators can, can probably reflect. Um, yeah. Yeah. So teachers have a great role to play here. I agree with, uh, with the comment in, in the chat box. Yeah.
Yes, I think the elective feels like it's it's a small change. I, I mean, I, yes, the elective will fail, but I think um, uh, it wasn't enough. I think it's what we are trying to address here. Um, okay. Yes, um, uh, now we would like to end the session. Uh, thank you, uh, Hidal, for uh, uh, spending your precious, valuable time with us and, uh, um, and giving us a deep insight about uh, your research work which you've uh, um, uh, done in your PhD. Uh, thank you, and um, uh, I would uh, really uh, would want to have more of these sessions with you later on in future. And uh, it was a really good and informative session for all students and professionals on this platform. Um, and um, um, uh, a sincere thanks from uh, our College of Architecture and. Uh, Professor Selish Nayasar, our principal. He uh, could not be here on this platform because of such reasons. Um, but on behalf of all the faculties of uh, College of Architecture, SVIT, I would like to thank you once again. And uh, uh, I would just like to say thank you to you, Rohini, uh, for, for organizing this. And I think you have, uh, you have taken an important step in, in, uh, in bringing uh, a a research-based culture within your institution. So I think I, I would like to congratulate you on, on organizing this too. I think uh, I, you're very right in this uh, aspect that uh, a research to, um, uh, you know, uh, profession as well as academia is something which is very critical uh, and has to be implemented into work so that uh, things change for a better future and uh, we hope so that we do a very i mean we start with a very uh, small part of it and then maybe take it to a higher level uh, yeah um, thank you all uh, attendees for attending this session uh, we would like to end this session over here thank you once again thank you bye yeah bye